So in the last class, we had started discussing a particle moving in a potential. And <clears throat> the wave function for such a part particle, I had told you, is governed by the Schrodinger equation. The spelling of Schrodinger I had given you is wrong. It is actually spelled this way, where this character actually doesn't appear in the English script. So we can just use a O. This was the Schrodinger equation. Let us, which governs the time evolution of the wave function. Let us <coughs> discuss this briefly before going ahead. So the initial condition for the Schrodinger equation is the wave function defined at some time, t naught. I have shown the x and y axis. You can assume that the z axis is also there somewhere. And the wave function psi is defined on this space, is defined everywhere throughout space at some initial time, t naught. And we want to use Schrodinger equation to evolve it to some later time. The first question which arises is, is just giving the wave function sufficient? Or do you have to give some time derivatives of the wave function? Well, <clears throat> it so happens that for the Schrodinger equation, just specifying the initial wave function everywhere is sufficient. Because once you know the initial wave function, you can use the Schrodinger equation to calculate del psi del t at every point over here. You can use the Schrodinger equation. So the right hand side only involves the wave function at the time t naught. It does not have any time derivatives. It only has spatial derivatives and the potential. So if you are given the wave function at the time t naught, you can evaluate the the rate of change with time of the wave function. So you, once we know this, we can use it to evaluate the wave function at every point at some slightly later time, delta t distant away. So this is the same space at some later time, delta t. So using this, when delta t is very small, this is sufficient. If you make delta t somewhat larger, then you will have higher derivatives. So you ensure that delta t is sufficiently small. Then you can use just the first derivative of psi to calculate psi at some time instant t plus delta t. Using this, you can get the wave function everywhere over here. So basically, you can get psi at all points at the time t plus delta t. And then you can repeat this procedure again and again and evolve the wave function to some arbitrary large time. So this is roughly the procedure by which you can evolve the wave function. And we see that this giving the value of the wave function at some initial time is sufficient. Suppose you were to numerically evolve the wave function, this would be roughly how you would go about doing it with some slightly more sophisticated algorithm. Analytically, this is not the way in which we go about evolving the wave function. Let me just briefly discuss one situation where we can look at the evolution of the wave function that is for a free particle. Let us go back to this example which we have been dealing with for the past few classes, the Gaussian wave packet. So this is a Gaussian wave packet with a corresponding to a particle with mean momentum p naught. And we had evaluated the wave function at the time t equal to 0. And we found that the wave function is this. Now let me point out one something wrong which I had been doing in all the previous classes. And this is that the function e to the power i by h cross p x minus e t, this is the wave 
corresponding to a particle with momentum p. The minus sign which we had been using earlier should not be there. Okay, there should be no minus sign over here. This is the wave corresponding to a particle with momentum p. The minus sign which we had been using has made no difference until now. But if you keep on using it, we will find that we get some inconsistency later on. So to avoid that, we will drop the minus sign. This is the wave function for reasons which we shall understand as we go along. This is the wave function corresponding to a particle with momentum plus p moving along the x-axis. So the wave function corresponding to this wave packet is shown here. It has a e to the power i p naught x by h cross indicating that the particle has a mean momentum of p naught along the x direction and it has some spread in x quantified by this b or if you look at the same wave packet in Fourier space as given by A of p, you can see the, that it has a spread in the momentum also. Now we want to study the time evolution of this wave packet or this wave function. So this is the initial wave function. It is defined everywhere along the x-axis. We want to see how it evolves in time. So one possibility would be to use this in the Schrodinger equation as the initial condition. <coughs> so we want to solve this equation in one dimension. So we just use one dimension here with the initial condition that at t equal to 0, we have this wave function. Now the method, one possible way of solving this is as follows we know the time evolution of each of these different momentum waves. And the time evolution of each of these momentum waves is given by this. That in time, it just oscillates with a frequency e by h cross, angular frequency e by h cross. So for each p, each fixed value of p, we know how it evolves in time. We can use this to find the time evolution of this wave function as follows. So psi as a function of x and t is nothing but the a of p which we had earlier, which is just some constant function of p. Now the e to the power ipx by h cross at some arbitrary time, you have to include the factor of minus et, this oscillation in time also, and you have to do this integral over p, keeping in mind the fact that e is itself a function of p given like this, e is equal to p squared by 2m. So the fact that it is a free particle has gone inside here. So the time evolution of this wave function can be worked out easily by just working out this integral over here. And we have already worked out this integral at the time t equal to 0. Now we have to work out this integral for any arbitrary time. This I'm going to leave to you as an assignment. It is not very different from the way we have worked this out for t equal to 0. So please calculate this integral. Calculate what the wave function is going to be at some arbitrary time later on, given what it is at t equal to 0 then calculate the probability of finding the particle at some point, the probability density, which is the mod of psi x t whole squared, which basically tells you the probability of finding the particle at some point. Calculate this, and then show the evolution of the probability density graphically. You will have difficulty in showing the evolution of the wave function graphically, because although initially, <clears throat> the wave function is real. If I drop this, if I have this term, the wave function is imaginary complex. But even in here, the wave function as it evolves in time, even if it starts from a real valued wave function, is going to become complex. So in general, this is going to be complex. You may not be able to show this graphically, but this is going to be real and you can show it 
graphically. So we want to look at the evolution of this, or how the wave packet actually evolves, how it spreads and how it moves in time, graphically. So this is the assignment which you are supposed to do. So use some graphics routine and show the results graphically. So let us now get back <coughs> to our discussion of the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation governs the wave function psi. And the wave function psi is to be interpreted as follows. The mod square of psi into dv, where dv is a volume element, dx, dy, dz, this product gives us the probability of finding the particle in this small volume. And this quantity, the mod of psi square, which is also psi into psi star, is denoted by rho. And this is the probability density. The probability density into the volume gives us the probability. The fact that the particle has to exist somewhere and that there is only one particle tells us that the integral of the probability density over the whole volume is 1. This is what is referred to as the normalization of the wave function. <coughs> now the question arises that suppose I start with a wave function, which is initially normalized. So the total probability of finding the particle somewhere is initially 1. Now suppose I evolve the wave function with the Schrodinger equation. Does the Schrodinger equation guarantee that the probability is going to remain 1? Or the question may be rephrased as follows. Does the Schrodinger equation conserve the probability? So let us look at this question. Does the Schrodinger equation conserve probability? To address this question, we have to work out the equation for the probability density. The Schrodinger equation tells you how the wave function evolves. We use this to find out how the probability density evolves. So to find out how the probability density evolves, <coughs> we require the time evolution of this quantity, psi into psi star, which is rho. So to calculate the time evolution of rho, we start from the Schrodinger equation itself. The Schrodinger equation is i h cross del by del t of psi is equal to minus h cross square by 2m del square psi plus v into psi, where v is a function of position, etc. I have not denoted that explicitly. What we do is we multiply this equation by psi star. So we have this. Now let us take the complex conjugate of the Schrodinger equation. The complex conjugate of the Schrodinger equation is minus i h cross del by del t of psi star is equal to the rest of everything here, all the except for psi is real. We had one imaginary, we had i here, which we had to replace by minus i. And all the size we have to replace by psi star, that will give us the complex conjugate of this equation. So let us work out the complex conjugate of the Schrodinger wave equation. So this is the complex conjugate of the Schrodinger wave equation. I multiply this. <coughs> by psi now if i subtract this from this i subtract the second equation from the first equation so what i get is i 
h cross del by del t of psi into psi star because these two terms combine to give del by del t of psi into psi star this is equal to if you notice the last two terms here are exactly identical because v is just a function i can interchange psi star and v and these two exactly cancel out so what i am left with is minus h cross square by 2m and i have psi star del square psi minus psi del square psi star now <clears throat> the right hand side over here the, the term in the square brackets can be further simplified so let us just look at the term in the square brackets so the term in the square brackets can be further simplified as follows this psi star del square psi minus psi del square psi star is equal to the gradient of psi star the gradient of psi minus psi the gradient of psi star this is because if you take this gradient and act it on the psi star and you take this and act it on psi dot gradient of psi star on both of here and here which cancels out so you are left with this or this so this the square bracket here can be replaced by this so what we have <coughs> using this what we obtain is del by del t of rho where psi into psi star is rho is equal to minus h cross one h cross cancelled out from both sides by 2 i m and then i have gradient of the rather divergence of psi star grad psi minus psi grad psi star which is nothing but an equation of this kind del rho del t plus the divergence of some vector quantity j is equal to 0 let us also identify what is j so the vector j is equal to h cross by 2 i m psi star grad psi minus psi grad psi star so <clears throat> let us now discuss what we have just derived so we find that the time rate of change of the rate of change with time of the probability density can be expressed related to the divergence of some quantity which we call the probability current so j which we have introduced here is the probability current
and this equation is I suppose already familiar to you, it is the continuity equation, right. So the <clears throat> what does the continuity equation implies? The continuity equation implies that if the probability is changing in some volume, if the probability changes with time, this change is, comp so if there is a small volume over here, <clears throat> suppose we take a small volume over here. The probability of finding the particle inside this small volume is rho into the volume. So if rho in this, the probability in, of finding the particle inside this is changing, which is what del rho del t implies, this change is accompanied by some flow of probability either in or out of the volume. And that flow of probability is what is quantified by the probability current j. So if the probability changes with time, it is accompanied by a flow which ensures that the probability goes into the neighboring volumes. And as a consequence, probability is conserved. Let us mathematically work this out. <clears throat> suppose we take some, okay, so suppose we have some volume V. And we integrate that the probability of finding the particle in this volume V is the integral of the probability density rho dV over this volume capital V. <clears throat> this is the probability of finding the particle in this volume. Let us take a volume which is sufficiently large and let us take a particle which we know for sure is located inside that volume. For example, suppose we are doing an experiment in this room and the experiment is being done with one electron, then we know that the electron is somewhere in the room. So if the volume is the whole room, then we know for sure that the electron is inside. So the probability of finding the electron in the room is given by the integral of the probability density over this volume. And we want to find out the rate of change of this. Does it change or not? If probability is conserved, even if the particle evolves in time, if the wave function evolves in time, this total probability of finding the particle inside should not change. Because the probability has to be somewhere inside. So this <coughs> integral now is equal to this integral. So the rate of change of the total probability of finding the particle can be obtained by integrating del rho del t for each small volume and add, just adding up del rho del t for each of the small volumes inside. And this we just saw is nothing but minus the divergence of the probability current integrated over the volume. Now <clears throat> this volume integral of some of the divergence of this current can be converted into a surface integral by using Gauss theorem. So this is nothing but a surface integral of j dot ds. Now suppose we choose the volume sufficiently large <coughs> so that we know for sure that the particle is inside. So the wave function drops off to zero at the surface of this volume, at the edges of this volume. Since the <coughs> current density involves the wave function and its complex conjugate and gradients, this function, the current, probability current, we can assume falls off as you go to the surface of the volume. And provided this current falls off faster than 1 by r squared, if you make this volume sufficiently large, this integral will disappear.
which implies that the total probability of finding the particle inside, if it is 1 to start with, it is going to remain 1. Or the total probability is conserved. Not only is the total probability globally conserved, that is inside this whole volume, but it is also locally conserved, which is what this implies. That is, if the probability at this point goes down, then the probability, has, that means the probability has actually flown to the neighboring points through this probability current. So we find that the probability, the Schrodinger equation conserves the probability as it evolves the wave function. Now, <clears throat> let us digress a little and discuss some aspects of probability distributions before we go on with the interpretation of the wave function. So let us just consider some simple probability distribution first. For example, let us look at the probability distribution of some discrete quantity. Let us say, for example, the probability distribution of the age of people. If you look at the probability distribution of the age of, let us say, the students in IIT, the undergraduate students, you will find that it will have some distribution. So this, this is the probability, and this, these are the values of the ages. It will have some distribution. And the distribution may be peaked, let us say, over here around 20. And then you may find that it has some distribution like this. <clears throat> so you may find people who are below 20, who are above 20, but on the the maximum probability is of finding people with some age. Now, if you want to calculate, so the probability of finding some age a i is what is shown here. Now, suppose I ask you the question, what is the average age of people on the campus or undergraduate students in this class or somewhere on this campus? How will you find that? OK, before we address that question, the total probability of all the ages is equal to 1. This is by definition. The second question is, suppose you want to find the mean age, then what we do is we take each possible value of age multiplied by the probability of getting that age, and this gives us the expectation value of the age. So if I go to some undergraduate hostel or somewhere and randomly choose a person, this is what I would expect him to, the age I would expect him to have. Actually, he will not have that age. He may have some different age. But on the average, this is what I get. And this is what we call the expectation value. So if I choose somebody at random, this is what I, the value I would expect him to have. Now, we can also ask the question that if I actually choose a person, he is, his age is not going to be this, in most, most probably. So how are the ages distributed around the mean value? So this is quantified by the variance, or the mean squared. And that is calculated as follows. I look at the difference from the mean. And I can square this and then take the average. This is the going to be a quantification of how spread are the values in the ages. And this is going to be denoted by delta A 
squared the expectation value of this. So if I go to a hostel and take the ages of the people there in the living in the hostel and find out the mean, find out the average value, and then find out the spread in the values, I will find that the ages will lie in a very small range. Say the lowest student may be 16 years old, at, or something like that, and the oldest may be 24 at most. So the dispersion, the spread in the values is not going to be very large. The mean may lie somewhere at 20, <clears throat> and then I can also have a variance or the dispersion. Suppose instead of going to your hostel, I went to Gold Bazaar, the market, and looked at the mean value at the dispersion. There I may find infants whose age is one year old to people who are as old as 80 years. So although the mean may turn out to be the same, the spread in the values is going to be much larger. So the distribution, if I go to some place like Gold Bazaar, may be much broader. And this fact that the distribution is much broader is quantified, one of the ways of quantifying it is in this variance, which tells you the spread in the values. This is the, also ref, will be referred to as the uncertainty in A. So if I go to a hostel and tell you the mean value, then if I make a measurement, I go and just ask one person his age, it is going to lie very close to the mean value. The uncertainty is small. If I go to some market, find out the mean value, and then you go and ask one person what is his age, it could have a very large variation. It could be 80, it could be 1. So there, the uncertainty is much larger. So this is, <clears throat> both of these are quantities of interest. For a continuous distribution, Instead of probabilities, I have a probability density. For, so for a continuous distribution, suppose we look at the age again. <clears throat> the age, if you measure with arbitrary accuracy, it could be into the nearest second. Okay, if you, I mean, so that will have a continuous distribution then. Previously, we were considering age in years. But the age of a person is actually a continuous variable, it could lie anywhere. This is time in, say, seconds, and it could lie anywhere. And it will have some smooth distribution. And this gives the probability of finding a person with a certain age. So you could have a person whose age is 20 years, 3 days, <clears throat> 5 seconds, and you can have milliseconds, etc. So it's a continuous variable in this case. So now if you want to calculate the average age, you have to do an integral this integral, which is the same as this sum for a discrete case. So now, let us see, let us use rho here instead of p, rho a, so rho a dA. For a continuous distribution, asking what is the probability of getting a person with age exactly two years is zero, because the number of points on this line is infinite, and you cannot ask the probability of getting one point on the line. What is meaningful is the probability of the age lying in some interval, dA. And the probability of the age lying in some interval, dA, is given by the probability density rho a into dA. So the probability of getting a person with the age in the interval dA around the value a is rho a dA. And to find the average, I have to multiply a with the probability of getting a and add up over all possible values, which is this integral. And this is the expectation value of a. Similarly, if I want to look at the spread in the values, then I have to look at <clears throat> 
Now, the uncertainty in A, this expression for the uncertainty in A can be simplified slightly. So, what we have is A minus the average squared, which is equal to the expectation value of A squared minus 2A which is equal to the expectation value of A squared minus 2 times the expectation value of A into the expectation value of A. This is just a constant number. So, the expectation value of A into this constant number is the expectation value of A into the constant number minus which is equal to A square minus a square. So, this is the final result. The expectation value of <coughs> minus, <coughs> sorry, there will be a plus here, and final result has a minus sign. Okay. <coughs> so, we shall be using these quite often. Now, let us go over to our quantum mechanics. So, for quantum mechanics, the probability density is calculated from the wave function. And the probability density gives us the probability of finding the particle in some <coughs> small infinitesimal volume dV. Let me just So, the probability density for finding the particle in this region of space is given by the wave function into its complex conjugate, that is what is rho. Now, suppose we ask the question, what is the, where do we expect to find the particle? So, suppose I have an electron somewhere in the room and I know its wave function. Now, we can calculate the position where we expect to find the electron. That is, suppose I repeat the experiment 1000 times. Each time I will get a different position for the electron. The probability of getting the positions will be defined by this, will be given by this. If I take all of these values and I find out the mean, that is what is the expectation value of the position. And I can predict this from the probability distribution and this can be calculated as follows. <coughs> so, the expectation value of R can be calculated once we know the probability density. We just take the probability density, multiply it by R and integrate over the whole volume. Similarly, we may also calculate the expectation value of any function of r in this fashion. So, suppose I ask what is the average value of r squared for the particle. So, this will be rho r t r squared d cube. Yes? So, Some function, sorry, there will be f here also. fr. fr. <coughs> so, the same function weighted with the rows. Now, <coughs> r is could be a function of time if the probability density itself is a function of time. Oh, sorry, there will not be a square here. I was just, oh, sorry, I was looking at a particular function, r squared. Okay. So, f of r, sorry, this will be just rho f of r t cube r. Okay. 
this is what the expectation value of some function of r is going to be. So this is a prediction of where we expect to find the particle. Every time we do the experiment, we'll get a different answer. If you look at the mean, this is what it should be. Okay. Now this <coughs> could be a function of time, and the, this could change if the probability density is changing. This the expectation value is also going to change. Now we know how to calculate the expectation value of the position of the particle because we have the probability density for the position of the particle. Now suppose I ask you the following question. I have a particle whose wave function I know, whose probability density I know. How can I find out the expectation value of the velocity of the particle? I can measure the velocity of the particle also. How do I find out the expectation value of the velocity of the particle? Right. So from correspondence principle, we would expect that if we differentiate the expectation value of the position, we will get something that should correspond to the expectation value of the velocity of the particle. Or another way of putting it is that if you look at the average quantities, they should follow the classical laws. We expect those quantities to follow the classical laws. So <clears throat> if you ask the question, So we can predict the average position of the particle at any instant. And if we differentiate this, we get something which we call the v of r, average of v of r. And we expect this from the correspondence principle that in the <coughs> average, I have many quantum systems. Each Suppose I have replicas of the same electron. I have a thousand rooms like this, each one has an electron. The motion of each electron, the individual electron, has to be described by a wave. I can no longer use classical mechanics. But we expect that if I take the average, then the average behavior should be describable by classical mechanics should correspond to the classical behavior. Because we, we see that in nature, things behave according to classical mechanics in some limit. In some limit, we find that things behave like in a quantum fashion. So we expect that if you look at the average behavior, we should recover the classical behavior. So let us see if it actually turns out to be OK. So this we shall do, okay, we shall proceed in the next class. I will stop here today.